Well, good morning. My name is David, and I am the senior pastor here at Walden Community Church, and we are starting a brand new series. And uh, I want to start with, I think Christians are concerned about right and wrong. What do you think? Right? I mean, they try to address the questions, what are we supposed to do? How are we supposed to live? What's the best way to please God? But one of the most common criticism that I've heard from atheists is that Christians are way too overbearing with their rules and they seem to want to impose their beliefs on everybody else. Or even worse, Christians themselves pick and choose which rules they want to follow. Atheists often point out that the Old Testament rules that uh, Christians don't follow seem to be hypocritical. So why are Christians so judgmental when even they don't follow all the rules? Do Christians just pick and choose what rules they want to follow? Well, if you've been a Christian for a while, or you've sat in church for a few years, I think you quickly realize that being a Christian is not easy. In fact, following Jesus is hard. Obeying Jesus is even harder. Sometimes even hearing Jesus' teaching can kind of make you squirm in your seat. When we hear these hard teachings, we grimace and we raise our eyebrows and we open our eyes wide and say, what? <laughs> Surely, I mean, Jesus doesn't want me to do that, doesn't he? Let's talk about that. At this time, I'd like to ask that all seats be in the upright position, all tray tables returned to their locked positions, secure your valuables, and hold on to your hats and glasses, folks, because this is going to be a bumpy ride. For the next five weeks, we're going to be looking at the most difficult teachings of Jesus. We have almost 40 commands from Jesus in his ministry, and 40 is, well, 40 is a lot, right? And Certainly, some of his teachings are more easy to follow than others. So, I mean, then isn't it okay if we ignore some? Jesus told his disciples in John 14, if you love me, keep my commands. So, I think it's safe to say that he would tell us the same thing. And with that comes difficult teaching number one. Matthew 6, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Translation, do not love the world. Do not love the world. That's a tough one because the world is all we know. I mean, can we, can we love the world a little bit? <laughs> like, can we love Jesus 60% and, and the world 40%? Look at what else Jesus says. Whoever loves his life loses it, and whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. John 15, if the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. So apparently, we have to hate the world, and the world hates us right back. And then John says it even more clearly, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. So first, I think we need to clarify what we mean when we say the world, okay? After all, God created this place we call Earth, and I think we're supposed to appreciate its beauty and its splendor. We're supposed to take care of its resources, take care of the Earth and the heavens, right? God has given us the world and the sky we live in to appreciate and enjoy. So what does scripture mean when it says the world and what am I supposed to hate? When we use the world that today, we're talking about the physical earth usually, right? The, the blue sky and the stars above. Jesus says, my words are always true and always here with you. Heaven and earth will pass away but my words will never pass away. So we do know 
that the world as we know it will one day be gone. So when I say that we as believers should not love the world, I mean that we must not become so attached to the world, but rather we should become more attached to Jesus and to heaven. You know, in Jesus' teachings, he says that we are not to love the world so much that we want to stay here, that we put treasure here. He says your treasure should be there. Another way of looking at defining the world would be all of the systems, all of the man-made governments, the, the societies, the cities, the, the world can become so secular as opposed to spiritual. And if we're talking about worldly politics more than the heavenly kingdom, if we're obsessed more with earthly laws than kingdom laws, Paul reminds us in Philippians, our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. So the bottom line, we shouldn't love any worldly system to the point that we become more attached to that system or that organization rather than God or heaven. But more importantly, when the world is used, that word in the Bible, it typically means this system of lust and evil, pride, rebellion against God, because the world is also a sinful place and it's a distraction. The world is full of shiny things all around us, the, the things that get our attention, the things that say, try me and do this. Your life would be so much better if you had this. The world offers us very fast, easy fixes for anything we want. The world offers us endless fun without having to consider the cost. The world offers us religions where we can just pick and choose which parts we want to obey and still be right with God somehow. The world tells us, you know, it's, it's okay to be religious, just, you know, not too much. Just as long as you don't tell anybody else what to do. And if there's religious beliefs that differ from yours, just respect them. You know, treat them as equals. Meanwhile, the world says, make all the money you want, you know, and, and blow it on yourself. Give God a, a little donation every now and then, but don't even think about tithing every week. It's amazing how many of us say that we love the Lord, but we won't even put $50 a week into the offering plate. We'll brag about our $500 phone or our $300 shoes or our, our manicured lawn or our new jet ski or fishing boat or our Birkin purse or our trips to Europe. The world offers us endless distractions and entertainment and advertisements, ways of thinking, alternative lifestyles, beauty competitions, sporting events, politics, and a whole lot more. It's easy. It is very easy to fall in love with the world. Because it looks good, sounds good, feels good, promises a lot. It always seems to work in our favor. It always has something new to give us. And if we don't direct our energies toward loving God, then we will, will, then we will respond to loving the world. That magnetic pull of the world, it just seems stronger than the pull of God. And if we don't want God, then the love of the world becomes overbearing. All you have to do is sit around and do nothing. <laughs> just, get, just get bored. And I guarantee you the world will lead you somewhere that you'll regret having gone. Let me tell you a story. Real life person who loved the world and the praise of others so much that it killed him. Samson was a real life superhero. That guy was straight out of the MCU. Only he was a real person. He lived in a real time in history. In fact, before he was born, God told his parents that he would be extra special. His mother wasn't to drink any alcohol during her pregnancy. She wasn't to eat any unclean food. And during his life, Samson was never to have a haircut because it was a symbol that he was set apart from all others. And as Samson grew, he became powerful and superhumanly strong. And the Bible says the Lord was with him. 
One day a lion came charging at him, and, and without any weapon, Samson tore the lion to pieces with his bare hands. On another occasion, he killed 30 enemy soldiers in their own town. In another story, he'd been tied up with ropes, and when the enemy troops came in, uh, he just split the ropes. The Bible says the ropes melted away like wax. One time he found the jawbone of a donkey, and he used it as a weapon, and he killed a thousand people in that battle. His power was awesome. It was unmatched. And the amazing thing was, nobody knew the secret of his strength. But Samson did have a weakness. And it was the call of the world on his life. The desires of chasing after the wrong kind of women. The Bible says Samson ruled as a judge for 20 years. But the love of the world still had a hold on him convinced him that he was missing out on all the fun that could be his. And as a matter of fact, Samson said, you know, I've been a judge and I've been a good judge. I deserve to do something fun for myself once in a while. Isn't it strange how we can believe that since we've been faithful to serving God for a while, that somehow we deserve to have a little bit of sin every now and then? What worldly thing lures you away? What part of the world is tugging at your coattails? It's not just you. It's all of us. The temptation to fall in love with the world, it's always there. It doesn't even have to be sin. It can be anything that distracts you from God. It causes you to put the things of God on the back burner of your life. At first, Samson didn't want anyone to know what he was doing. So he went to a, another town where he thought I, he wouldn't be recognized. Samson left his own city. He went to the land of his enemies to find a prostitute in a foreign city. He intended to spend the entire night there, but the people in that city, they saw him, they recognized him, and they decided that they were going to kill him in the morning. Well, for some reason, Samson woke up in the middle of the night. Samson not only woke up, but his arrogance got the best of him, and he just had to show off. So instead of sneaking off like he should have, he goes to the city gates, rips up those massive gates, and carries them all the way to the top of the hill. Why? Because he's Samson. Because he could. He's entitled. He felt he was deserving. One day he saw another woman, Delilah. This time he really fell in love. And he was so smitten, he was completely willing to trade his love for God, for this woman. He leaves his place of leadership that God had given him. He moves in with this woman, doesn't marry her. They're just shacking up together. After all, the world just, you know, says, you don't, you don't need to be committed. Just have a good time. You're two consenting adults, and Samson is sure Delilah is the best thing that has ever happened to him. And, and doesn't God want me to be happy? But he didn't know what Delilah was doing. She had an ulterior motive to being with him. She had struck a deal with his enemies to be paid off if she could find the answer to Samson's strength because they wanted to overpower him. They wanted to capture him. Samson is head over heels in love with her. And he simply can't see the truth. He's not listening to God anymore. Delilah she sees Samson as a ticket to her future. He is her meal ticket to wealth and happiness. Samson's all in. She's the one. But Delilah, she's only in it for the money. So as often as she can, she asks Samson what the secret to his strength is, and each time Samson refuses to tell her. She even pulls the, how can you say that you love me if you won't be honest with me? And she keeps asking him, day after day after day, nagging him. So we might think that we're strong. We might think, oh, I can, I can resist temptation. I'm strong enough. But see, not even Samson, with all his strength, could stand against temptation, against the temptation of the world. The world will eventually wear you down and wear you out. And one day he breaks down and tells her. He says, you know, I was, I was set apart at birth from God and I have never had a haircut. I've never shaved my head. And if I did, I would become weak just like any other person. 
And Delilah said, you do love me. Oh, thank you for telling me. This calls for a drink. Here, uh, don't mind the fact that this is, uh, yeah, don't mind the fact that this is bubbling and smells like chloroform. Here, drink. <laughs> Meanwhile, she's sending a text message to the enemy. It's on tonight. Bring back the soldiers and bring back all the bags of money that you're going to give me. And, you know, you'll be able to do whatever you want. I don't know what she put in his drink, but when he went to sleep, he fell asleep on her lap with complete confidence that she loved him, with complete assurance that he was safe. Everything was all right with the world. And while he slept, they shaved his head clean. And when his hair left, so did his strength. She screamed, Samson, the enemies, your enemies are at the door. And he jumped up. But the Bible says that he didn't know the Lord had left him. That's a tricky thing when we choose a life of going after the world, we're usually not aware that God didn't follow us. Samson goes to lift one of the guys and for the first time, he can't even get him off the ground. This time it's him that goes flying through the wall, bashing his head. They beat him down until there's nothing left to beat. He's probably calling out for Delilah to help him, but she walks in with her bags of silver and she and the men are laughing at him. They gouge out his eyes, and he's blind for the rest of his life. They put him in prison. They force him to push a grinding uh, wheel to crush grain. And in prison, the world forgets about him. You know, we tell the story of Samson as a cautionary tale. But we're unwilling to admit that we have things in common with him. We, you know, we, we talk about Samson's love for the world and we'll say things like, oh, I, I know somebody just like that. But I think if we were honest, we would say, yeah, I, I'm just like that. Jesus has come to keep us from falling in love with the world. And the only way that we're going to avoid that entanglement is if we fall in love with him. It's not enough to just know the difference between right and wrong. Samson knew the difference between right and wrong. There has to be a love for God that says, you're always going to be first in my life, no matter what. Pleasing you is going to be far more important than pleasing anything else, including myself. Falling in love with Jesus is going to save you from falling in love with the world. Jesus tells this parable. A farmer went out to sow his seed, and as he scattered seed, some fell among the path. And the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants, so they couldn't bear grain. Still other seed fell on good soil, it came up, grew, produced crop, some multiplying 30, some 60, some 100 times. Jesus explains, the farmer sows the word. Some people are like the seed that falls along the path where the word is sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. Others like seed sown in rocky places hear the word and once receive it with joy, but since they have no root, they only last a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. Still others, like seeds sown among thorns, hear the word, but the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desires for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. Others, like seed sown on good soil, hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop. Some 30, some 60, some 100, 100 times what was sown. You know what I think? I think the soil that Samson falls into is thorny soil. I have seen more people leave the faith not because of theological differences or philosophical issues or even dissatisfaction with the church or a conflict with another Christian. They will simply leave the church because they're too busy. You know? <laughs> their lifestyle says, you need your Sunday back. 
You need your weekend back. I mean, what's church really giving you anyway? How is it really helping you? It's a major issue. It's a major issue in Jesus' day. It's a major issue today. And the reason it is such an issue is that we are constantly being told that we don't have the right life. You know, that if we bought this product or lost this weight or used this conditioner or drove this car or drank this beer or ran this race or slept with this person or had these muscles, then we would have that life. But it's a lie. In John 10, Jesus says, anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate but climbs in by some other way is a thief and a robber. The one one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. And Jesus used this figure of speech because the Pharisees did not understand what he was telling them. Therefore, Jesus said again, very truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. The world comes into our life through the back door through television, through advertisements, through social media. And it says, come with me. I'll give you the life you want. You're poor. You're ugly. You're useless. You're undesirable. Come with me and you'll be rich, beautiful, accomplished, desirable. And all you have to do is buy this. Or do this. Jesus says in Matthew, come to me all who are weary and burdened and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. See, the amazing thing is that the things of this world, all it has to offer is flimsy, thin plastic compared to Jesus. In fact, much of what the world has to offer isn't even real. It doesn't even exist. Samson woke up to the emptiness of the love of the world and it cost him his freedom and ultimately his life. We need to realize that all the things that we are running after are not worth it. Uh, and, And they're killing us. Other people take the love of the world to the grave with them. The things that this world offers will not give you life, and they definitely won't give you life to come. Let's go back to John's passage. John says, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him for all that is in the world. The desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life is not from the Father, but it is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. So, what is the part of the world that we are supposed to hate? John defines his own meaning in the verse. He says, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but of the world. And that word, translated lust, in the Greek, it's the word that speaks to a desire that has too much heaviness in your life, too much weight in your life, just like what Samson experienced. Lust, cravings that control you. He says lust of the flesh. Normally, we have a healthy desire, but you take it out of context. You remove it from a committed relationship. And lust says, without this, you won't be happy. So you disobey the laws of God to get it, no matter what the cost. Is sex the problem? No. Is sex a sin? No.
but as a culture, it becomes wrong in how we treat it. How about lust of the eyes? This happens when you see something good in the world that becomes so important that you'd sacrifice anything else to get it. I see people do this all the time with money. They put themselves in a bad financial situation, go into debt for stuff that they think they need, things that they think will satisfy. But just like the lust of the flesh, this is worldly and eventually it's all stuff that's gonna end up in a landfill. Pride of life consists of raising some aspect of your life, which is not necessarily bad, or, or it's just you raise it up to the level that it defines you. You know, you, you feel confident because of the, the number in your bank account or because of the number of friends you have or because of the talent you have. But when something other than God becomes the confidence for your future, you're engaging in worldliness. You're giving glory to a lesser thing. John does not say, avoid these things in every way. He says, do not be consumed with these things. Because if your life is consumed with these things, even good things, then it shows that the love of the Father is not the most important thing. God has been displaced. God has been outweighed by a lesser thing in your life. This is why John ends his book with this statement. He says in John, uh, 1 John 5, little children, keep yourself from idols. <laughs> because that's the essence of idolatry, right? When you love something more than God, depend on something more than God, obey something more than God, like the lust that John mentions above, it's not a good thing when it becomes the ultimate thing. But only God can support the weight that so many of us put into things. The tragedy of idolatry is not that we simply disobey, but that we are placing our ultimate trust and weight into something that isn't supposed to bear that weight. We are supposed to keep our eyes on Christ. Hebrews 12 says, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. If the world around you is a lie, then you need to counter it with truth. And when you see those lies, you need to remind yourself, this does not bring me life. Say that over and over again in your head. Say it out loud when you see those commercials. This will not bring me life. When it appears on TV, when you feel that pull when you're watching someone else's life on social media, this will not bring me life. Write it on your credit card. This does not bring me life. Begin to recognize the things that have power over you and begin to get rid of them. Let's pray. Lord, the world is all around us. And for many, this is all we know. Its voice is deafening. Its temptation is overbearing. And the desire and the pull to love the world and the things of this world is so strong. We get wrapped up in worldly politics as if it matters. We get wrapped up in the desire to make money, to live a life of wealth and ease and comfort. We compare ourselves with one another and we feel lack when others are faster or stronger or more beautiful than us. You love us just as we are, as our parent. And your only desire is that we fall in love with you and follow you. That we would seek you first above all things. Seek the kingdom before the world. Lord, may we have the ability to listen to the still small voice. 
May we have only the desire to follow you all the days of our life, to seek you and to put you first above all things. Thank you for your love and grace. Amen. Hey, I would just remind you that uh, we are here. Walden Community Church is uh, here in Montgomery, Texas. We have two services every week. We have a 930 service with a choir. We're going to sing traditional hymns. We're going to say the Lord's Prayer. We're going to have communion. Uh, we're going to do responsive readings. It's going to feel exactly like the church that you grew up in. Between services, we have coffee and donuts. And of course, regardless of the service you attend, we invite you to to that, to meet one another. And then at 11 o'clock, we have a contemporary service, we have a worship team, and we have a full program for children from birth all the way through high school. And we want to be the church where you live. I'll see you guys next week. Bye.